Um, so the first uh, set of speakers, I should actually say, uh, is uh, Mark uh, Cloudmans and Derek Glardino. Um, and they're from uh, the National Weather Service uh, at the, in the, the US. Uh, and uh, the presentation is about large scale uh, forecast based flood inundation mapping in near real time. Go ahead. Thank you, Albert. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Mark Lottemans. Um, I'll be speaking first. Um, I'm one of the directors in the Office of Water Prediction, which is part of the National Weather Service and NOAA and the Department of Commerce. Um, we talk about flood resilience being the theme. And, and as the title said, um, this is really about the flood inundation mapping program that we're going to talk about today. And uh, as it relates to mitigating and predicting uh, inundation extents uh, to support flood resilience and preparation and response. Um, I'll be talking about the, the program at the national level. Um, I represent uh, the national level and especially the development of the flood inundation mapping. And Derek, uh, as a senior hydrologist in one of our river offices, he'll be speaking to uh, some of the local efforts. Uh, next slide, Derek. Okay, first I wanna talk about you know, why we're doing this. Uh, we have a lot of priorities on the National Weather Service and the Water Prediction Program. We heard just a moment ago, there's gonna be a little bit of talk in a moment about drought, um, but you see the five sort of themes we, we address, we, we cover in the Office of Water Prediction in our program. Um, I'm really gonna to focus today on the flooding aspect on the far left and uh, really repeat some buzzwords here. Um, we're trying to really uh, advance a whole new generation that's been in progress for a few, few years of water prediction services. And that involves providing consistent high resolution information um, that meets a lot of needs that really haven't been met uh, historically as we focused on sort of uh, the primary river areas, but really trying to go more continental in scope and at high resolution. And then to have that information be used for decision support and for actionable intelligence uh, for all those purposes I just said, response, mitigation, preparation, and so on. Next slide, Derek. <clears throat> okay, I'm very pleased to be part of the National Water, Water Center, which is in the Office of Water Prediction. Uh, it's located in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and uh, that was stood up about five years ago, um, and it's the first of its kind in the Weather Service, and it's intended to be the Center of Excellence for Water Resources Science and Prediction, really across the whole federal water program. Um, and then we, we have a lot of focus on getting a common operating picture across all our offices around the country. We have a lot of offices at the local level and we're working towards establishing an operations component, which we already have in an initial phase. And next year we will be establishing uh, more full operating capabilities for that operations component. So we do research development and operations and everything in between. And we support our field offices, uh, which for the Weather Service, uh, I'll show on the next slide. Uh, next slide, Derek. So if you didn't know, uh, this is how the United States uh, Weather Service, National Weather Service organizes their local offices. Uh, those blue boundaries are watershed based and those define the 13 river forecast centers. There's 13 of them. Uh, and Derek uh, happens to be from the Dallas Fort Worth office there. Thank you, yeah, where the cursor is moving. And then there's uh, many more weather forecast offices, but which also do a considerable amount of hydrologic support at the local level. Uh, there's 122 of those. And that's each, each one of those typically has a radar and that's where you get much more of the local picture um, for the hydrologic and, and other weather phenomena. Next slide. Okay, we can't do this alone in across the federal water spectrum. Um, so we have a lot of key partners. We absolutely work together with actively and, and can't do our job without them. And we support them, but I wanted to call out a few of them. USGS, the Geological Survey, um, focuses on information science. We get the majority of our stream gauge and precipitation information from the USGS. We work heavily with the Army Corps of Engineers who does considerable water management in our country. And, and manages a lot of uh, infrastructure and projects. And then our mission, if you didn't know with NOAA, is really about the prediction and warning. Our mission about, is about protecting uh, life, limb, and property and providing decision support uh, to enable that. And then also we have a partnership uh, through this integrated water resource science and services, I should mention, where FEMA is a, is a core member and they work with us heavily. And we, we consider them one of our elite customers, if you will, in defining 
really at the national level, the federal level, uh, the emergency response um, that's necessary during uh, flood events and other water hazard events. Next slide, please. Okay, kind of at the center of this, uh, I talked about the water center being five years in about, um, a big part of our evolution to a whole new generation of services is built around the national water model. I think most people have heard of that. Um, as noted there, it's a continental scale model with high resolution, to use that term again, and very spatially continuous estimates of the entire water cycle. And it provides four, I'm sorry, information across uh, 3.4 million miles of rivers and streams. So pretty much every little creek in everybody's backyard down to the Mississippi River. Um, and that is those 3.4 million miles, it's worth noting, are, are sliced up into 2.7 million river reaches. So uh, a little bit over, uh, a, a rough, call it roughly a mile per reach, but at each one of those reaches, we have forecast information. And you're seeing a little bit of a snippet there on the bottom left there, there's our country, of course, and you sort of see the resolution uh, of those 3.4 million miles. And yes, you can zoom in and get forecast down very, very uh, high resolution at the street level. And obviously a lot of discharge information and other parameters can be uh, presented in the bottom right there, you see just a simple example of the kind of flood inundation mapping services we, we derive from the forecast information in the national water model. We've evolved the model through multiple versions. Right now we're at version 2.1, which was released earlier this year. Next slide. Okay, now I'd like to talk about inundation mapping uh, a little bit more directly. Um, hey, Derek, can you go to the next slide? Actually, these are slightly out of order. Uh, oh, yes, just a minute. One more, please. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, back. Um, so let me just stick to this slide. So the way we do our inundation um, is with a technique called height above nearest drainage, where each one of those river basins or catchments or watersheds that uh, are on those one mile or so reaches, uh, we, we know the boundary of the watershed and we have a digital elevation model that defines a train at 10 meter resolution. And then we look at the outlet point of each of those catchments or basins. And we look at the difference in elevation uh, of all those 10 meter cells um, in that catchment as it relates to the outlet point. And knowing the forecast at the outlet point, relate that to a stage. And then we look at the digital elevation model and flood out the overbank area for the stream. So in this diagram, you see, that's the DEM on the left uh, and on the right, uh, the zero blocks kind of going from top left to bottom right define the stream channel. And, and then in this uh, you know, hypothetical case, the, the blue shaded blocks on the right, that would be the inundation for this hypothetical event. So you do that over uh, you know, 10 meter cells over the entire country and you get a lot of processing which we perform every hour with a model, water model uh, cycle. Next slide. Okay, if you can hit it one more time, Derek, please. Thanks. So this is just another example of the hand grid on the top left and on the right. That's just showing the hand grid at national level. It's kind of a, a curious graph if you're wondering about the shading. Uh, the darker colors imply that there's very little relief to the landscape. Uh, so the difference in the, um, the elevation is not so great compared to the stream channel, channel outlet where the lighter colors are where you have a lot of uh, elevation difference. Um, but the point is that um, from this hand grid and using the water model discharges, which are based on these reach scale channel parameters. I'm not gonna go through it here, but based on Manning's equation and a lot of approximations um, and knowing the elevation, we define synthetic rating curves at each one of those 2.7 million reaches. And that allows us to relate the discharge to the stage at that location. And then again, flood out uh, the surrounding grid cells in that catchment to define the overall inundation extent. So that's the general high level overview of our method. Um, next, please. Okay, so what have we done with all this uh, method and techniques I'm talking about? Um, historically, we, we've had uh, different FIM libraries. Uh, we're starting today with these FIM libraries at the top, these static libraries, which cover about 200 locations and which in turn address about a thousand miles of river. Um, Important, that's an important thousand miles, but still just a, a literal drop in the bucket on the, the amount of water we want to model. Um, so we're taking that to next level with uh, the categorical static libraries for 3000 or so points in the country where we model the inundation at 
fixed thresholds like minor stage, moderate, major stage, and record stage. And that covers about 30,000 miles. So now, now, right, we're getting a little bit further along in the scope of coverage. But where we're really uh, targeting and what we have available now for um, a few years now, I'll explain that next slide. The dynamic mapping is really the crux of our inundation mapping program. And we have two classes of dynamic FIM, as we call it, flood inundation mapping. And the first one is based on the River Forecast Center's forecast. And remember, I said there's 13 of those. We take those forecasts at the points and we route those downstream to come up with a flundation map for those areas uh, downstream of the forecast points. And when you do the math, that adds up to 100,000 miles of rivers. So now we're getting somewhere, right? Um, but really the, the, the grand solution that we have uh, a major deployment coming up actually in a matter of a few months is to do the entire national water model domain uh, with the 3.4 million miles. And, and that moment is upon us. We are still doing a demonstration mode, uh, but the right side map there shows kind of the difference between our legacy service uh, coverage and the water model coverage. Those blue um, uh, riverways and waterways, uh, that's our legacy coverage. And you can see the density with the red that is introduced by the national water model. So uh, obviously allows us a lot more information to underserved or areas that are not served at all right now with information. Next slide. Okay, this is a snapshot right now today where we are providing these services. We have that high resolu resolution information provided in those blue shaded areas. And that's basically the Atlantic coast and the Texas coast um, with a little gap there in the Louisiana area, but that's getting the tropical systems and a lot of the uh, active hydrology. Um, uh, but in a matter of a few months, we'll be extending that coverage for the high resolution to the entire uh, lower 48 states. And then the gray area shows where we have those uh, river forecast center forecast um, uh, modeled with inundation mapping. And that's the one that adds up to those 100,000 river miles. And from the water model, we have different inundation uh, map products. Just a quick snapshot of that. We, we take the maximum typically over, say, 18 days, one day, two day, three day, five day, 10 days and also an outcast. So we have lots of versions of the inundation maps that show the extent of the inundations depending upon which model is contributing to the inundation. Next slide. Okay, this is my transition slide, setting it up for, for Derek, who's gonna talk about how this is uh, being implemented at the local level. Um, we have a demonstration in place now going on for four years really, where we've taken our flood inundation mapping information. We've put it on a, a enterprise geographic information system uh, that our field offices have access to. It is not available yet to the public, but uh, we provide those services that I've mentioned in the previous slides. And through a four year period, uh, we've demonstrated that at the, the West Gulf River Forecast Center, which is Texas plus New Mexico. And that serves uh, about 25 million US residents. And then we recently completed one in the Northeast United States um, which serves about 115 million residents. So that is the evolution to date. Uh, we have much more to do and advance as we operationalize this in the future. And I'm gonna turn it over to Derek as he's gonna talk about how they've made use of this information at the local level. Thanks, Mark. Uh, good morning from Dallas, Texas, and uh, good afternoon to all our international friends. Um, I'm going to talk about how everything Mark did, how we actually put it into the hands of emergency managers. And we did this over four separate tabletop events from 20, uh, 2018 to 2021 and involved over 200 different emergency management personnel, over 50 separate emergency management organizations. Uh, we, cho we chose uh, varying events with different hydrologic capabilities and, and, and problems and situations to try and really stress test all these flood inundation maps when they're in the hands of the people who make the decisions. Uh, we wanted to really see if it would improve the response uh, from them and help them determine uh, what developmental techniques we needed to work on to improve these services. And you can see the four events. Uh, we did two in Texas, Hurricane Harvey. Uh, we also did a Wimberley flood event. And then we did two in the Northeast RFC uh, River Forecast Center, uh, a March 2010 flood, and then the Tropical Storm Irene, all a little really unique in both geography and uh, event type. Uh, the first two tabletop exercises in Texas gave us one primary takeaway, and that was 
how they would use this would be to move and allocate their resources to respond to a flood event. It was really interesting. And what you're seeing here is them actually changing where they would move resources or activate resources or stage the different types of resources as they got new flood inundation maps throughout the tabletop exercise. So you can see how there's some large scale movement, moving it over counties and large distances from city to city. And then there's even some slight movement where they move it to different sides of the river based on the flood inundation map, cutting off their ability to get uh, resources to the right areas. So it was very interesting to see them move it real time as we gave them new flood maps. But they also gave us some recommended improvements. The, uh, the flood mapping that is being provided currently is just an extent map and their number one uh, identified uh, need would be uh, depth, helping them identify what type of resources they would need in an area. Uh, and you can see with the different level of depth, you need different types of resources to provide response and recovery. The second thing they wanted to see was a complete implementation. Mark talked about the river forecast centers having about 100,000 miles worth of coverage versus the, you know, the entire system, which is what the national water model could cover. If you provide them an inundation map that is limited based on what you have available and don't give them the complete picture, they says that provides a really conflicting message on what they're trying to do to respond. As you can tell the difference here between the blue and the red, I would change a lot about how this uh, city places its resources around uh, to provide response. The third thing they really wanted was confidence. They wanted to know our belief and our accuracy in a map. They understand forecasting is imperfect, when they are, but they don't necessarily understand the inaccuracies of the mapping itself. And that's really where they wanted to know our confidence and our belief into it. Timing and velocity are very important aspects from these as in that changes the type of resource they would need to pull people out of uh, inundated water. If the water is moving extremely fast, they can't just go in there with a boat, they would need a helicopter. And these are things they needed to know. They also need to know timing, how long until they can go back into the area to start cleaning up and start recovery efforts. When will it recede? When will it peak out? They needed to know these things and just a static map doesn't provide that. And one of the biggest things they talked about is that this is really changing the entire message. What you see here is a hydrograph. That's what we're providing currently. And what we're projecting to provide is something that looks like this, an entire map that gives them the idea of where this flood may be and where the extents may be going. In the second two uh, uh, tabletop exercises that we did was in the Northeast Arf River Forecast Center. And their primary takeaway was professional delivery. I talked about how they needed someone uh, to, to present this information so that they could understand the inaccuracies. And that was really their big takeaway from these two uh, tabletop exercises. They also like to see it in some kind of interactive mapping service where they're able to put their own resources on it, such as where is the critical infrastructure, such as hospitals and, and schools. Uh, put that overlaid where the map extents may be so they can make better decisions quicker. Some of the, re the responses we got were very similar. They still wanted depth, velocity, and confidence, but they provided some additional insight that we didn't get in the first two tabletops, uh, including the time to return to banks. Um, they really wanted to know when it receded completely to get all full-scale recovery into the area to be able to start the cleanup efforts, search and rescue and what not needed to be, be done. Another thing they felt was rate of rise. You can see two different hydrographs here that could paint two really different messages in the time that you have to respond to a flood event. So if you just give them a static map and don't tell them how quickly it's gonna get there, you could be putting a lot of people in the harm's way. So that was one important uh, uh, takeaway. They also want to know current versus forecast inundation. That really changes what type of resources you can get into an area and then may have to pull back out of an area if it is currently flooding and it's supposed to get worse or if it maybe it's supposed to start receding. So the current inundation versus forecast inundation is an important thing to take away. And lastly is training. They really wanted to know how much training would be involved and how much is going to take to change this flood message from going from a hydrograph, which we took years to get people to get used to using, to now a map 
a whole different idea on how to use this. So a, a large amount of training is going to have to be done with our partners to understand this new flood message. With that, I'll turn it back over to you, Mark. Thanks, Derek. Um, just to kind of close out, uh, you heard me talk about the national level, Derek, the local level. Um, we're obviously realizing as we're having actual deployments of this information, and it is available, it's not just enough to have a perfect inundation forecast, which we don't have, of course. But even if we did, uh, it's a major uh, coordination effort among our offices on how to deliver this information. And, and Derek's presentation just now talked about that uh, and, and addressed the feedback we're getting from our customers and how important it is to manage this information. Um, so just some closing comments, nothing terribly new. Uh, our water services are truly evolving. Um, we are maintaining our current services, but also with the national water model and all the dry products, really going to a whole new generation of high fidelity, high resolution products. Uh, we're working on getting state of the science, not just for the inundation mapping you're hearing today, but also with a collaborative effort on the national water model and the next generation development thereof. And uh, earlier, before the talk, we talked about collaboration a bit. I just want to say we do um, uh, have a GitHub repository for some co collaboration on our inundation mapping. I'm happy to discuss that outside of this call and, and also have a collaborative arrangement with the National Auto Model. Thank you very much for your time today, and I'll turn it back to Albert. <laughs>